Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Life is very much like 65. And uh, it's a thanksgiving kind of psalm, but 66 uh, has no uh, author to it. Did you notice that? One of the questions I ask on your discussion questions is, who wrote this psalm and when? Nobody knows. <laughs> but it's amazing how many commentators know that they know. <laughs> And they put it all the way from the time of King David to the time of Hezekiah. Well, we don't know. There's no way we can know. It's not named. In the Arabic translation, it said a psalm of David, but that is only one translation of many, not the older ones. We just don't know who wrote this psalm. We don't know the occasion. We don't know why. There's been a lot of theology uh, recently out of the Scandinavian countries that talk about the psalms being used once a year for the enthronement celebration. There's only one thing wrong with that. We know nothing about an enthronement celebration. It amazes me how people's presupposition, they can lay something down and they fit the Bible into it. We don't know when this psalm was done nor why it was done, but a clue may be, a clue. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's better if you read this psalm in your Bible and the clue to it is, what would you entitle this psalm? One more clue before you start reading. Is, is it written to congregation or to an individual? And as you figure that out, maybe the title will fit into who it's being spoken to in this psalm. I'll give you a minute to read it. Psalm 66. What do you think would be a good title? All right. I, that's it. Thanksgiving, praise. How would you link in the congregation in verses 1 through 12 and the individual in 13 through 20? How could we get that into a title? The church rejoices and the individual thanks God. Something like that. Uh, yeah. uh, some way we've got to deal with why it goes from the collective to the individual well there could be a million possible reasons and I, I really don't think I, I can answer that question except to say it's, it's important that we see that that it's going to change focuses from all God's people to one of God's people now the, the first thing in King James says uh, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Is that what it says, King James? Make a joyful noise. That's a... <clears throat> the only word I have problem with there is the word noise. Uh, this word is usually shout for joy. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. It's almost like God saying, Israel, when you sing and shout your praises to me, you just not quite loud enough. <laughs> so why don't we get the congregation of Israel and surround it by the choir of the whole earth. And on the count of three, one, two, three, let's all praise the Lord together. And only as all the children that God made join their voices together to praise him, only then is it loud enough to somehow fit what God does. Now this is exactly the, the almost exactly the different word for God is used in Psalms 100 verse 1 which is a psalm of thanksgiving uh, notice it says to all the earth this is one of the rare psalms right through this little section last week's this week's and next week's are going to include the universal element now you say well what does that mean it's very important that the concept of God one God if there really is one God and he created the world 
then God loves the Gentiles. And that's not something new. That's just logic of the fact there's one God who made all people, and this universal element inside the exclusiveness of Israel is a concept that we must hold to again and again, especially the book of Isaiah is almost a universal prophet. So here we have the whole earth shouting for joy in the presence of God and who he is and what he has done. And you know, um, that, that says something to me about Israel's theology that we often forget, that she had a wider vision than just herself. And notice where it says in verse 2, Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Singing is a part of worship. There is no worship without a singing heart. And there seems to be uh, no place in the Old Testament without worship, without a singing voice. Some have thought that what we have in verses 1 through 12 is the choir of the temple. And what we have in 12, I mean 13 through 20 is the solo voice coming out of the choir to sing his personal testimony as the choir has expressed its corporate testimony. Have you ever thought that when the choir sings in this church, they're expressing a corporate testimony, and when soloists sing, they're expressing an individual testimony? I think singing is a very great part of my life, though I can't sing very well. Vernon, don't you dare say amen. He told me after four years he's getting used to my voice. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's a compliment or what. But um, uh, singing meets a need of my life that nothing else meets. Uh, do you ever roll the windows up in your car and sing? I want to tell you, I can almost sing just like Cynthia Clawson in my car with myself. She never has said a word to me either. You know, she just sings along with me. Uh, so I think it's real important here that we sing the glory of his name. Now, what does his name mean? Whenever that word appears, or that phrase, his name, or his namesake, or what does that mean? It stands for the character of God. And I would even go a little further. I would say it stands for the character of God as revealed in his actions. We do not believe in a God who is defined by a philosophy or a logical system or by a creed. We believe in a God who does certain things in certain kinds of ways. And because God has acted in people's lives in the past in this way, we're quite confident that God's going to act in our lives the same way. Um, there's a book out called The God Who Acts. That's the difference in our God and every other one. Our God is a God who acts. Now, notice here where it says in verse 3, Say to God, how awesome are thy works. Now, where have you heard that before? It's the word terrible, frightening. Where have you heard that? Last week. Psalm 65, 5. Um, when God comes in mercy to Israel, sometimes he comes in judgment to others. And uh, that makes everybody stand up and think. It even makes us, when we see God act, think, My goodness. Uh, notice here where it says, Because of the greatness of thy power, thine enemies will give... Now that word, I'm not familiar with any of this word. I don't use that word much. Is that the word feigned? Uh, do you use that much, word much in conversation? I haven't feigned anybody in a long time. That may be a southern pronunciation. It be a whole deal different than north. I don't know. Uh, what does feigned mean? Feigned. Reject. Pretend, fake, okay? There's two translations here. I think King James, doesn't it have... Um, no, what does King James have? Submit. That is the exact same translation that American Standard Version and the Peshitta, which is the Aramaic translation, have. But that's not correct here. It's just not. This word is a fake submission. A, they're playing like they're listening, but they're not. And so uh, the Hebrew here... And the step two is that both have pretend obedience. I, that, that communicates better with me than feigned. Pretend obedience. Even in the face of God's power, they're just pretending obedience. Now, notice verse 4, which is an unusual verse to follow something about fake obedience. Listen to verse 4. All the earth will worship thee and will sing praises to thee. They will sing praises to thy name. Now, isn't that an unusual verse? 
to come right after fake obedience or pretending obedience. <clears throat> Uh, to me, this has got to refer to the last day. Uh, for first place, all the world is not going to worship God until Judgment Day. You say, you mean all the world will worship God one day? Yes, I think it will. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it is speaking specifically about the Christ, but I think it also affects the Father. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, those who are the angelic beings, those who are alive and those who are dead, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a day coming when every creation of God made in his image is going to bow down before our Christ and worship but the tragedy is it may be too late for salvation and a personal relationship then. The world will praise God one day. Every part, every nation, every tribe, every individual will bow the knee to the Father. Now, uh, notice where we're going to, new paragraph in verse 5, and mine has, let's see what yours has, mine has come and see the works of God. What does yours have? What? Real loud. King James has come and see. Come see glorious things, living Bible. Somebody else have one? Different one? Now here's a good example of what a translator does. And I want you to listen to me because sometimes you get so mad at me for changing your English translation. <clears throat> the Hebrew word here is the word go, not come. It's the word go. Why would, a, why would a consensus of English translations have come when the Hebrew words go? You don't translate. A good translation is not one that just takes a literal word for word, but that conveys the meaning. The word here in Hebrew, go, has the connotation of go and see for yourself. And so what English, that wouldn't sound good for us to go and see for yourselves. We would say what? Come and see for yourself. So it's a good translation in English to convey the meaning, okay? But the Hebrew word here is go in verse 5 and also down in verse 16. Uh, Come and see for yourself the works of God is, is the connotation. Who is awesome in his deeds. Again, terrible, frightening, not marvelous or wonderful. Terrible, frightening, awesome. You know, that kind of, that kind of idea. Tard who? What does your trade have? The sons of men? Does anybody here have the sons of Adam? Anybody? Who does, what does yours have, Joe? Children of men? This is the word, the sons of, and the word for man here, of men, is the word Adam. Now, Adam is a regular Hebrew word for man. Most every place outside the opening verses of Genesis is translated simply the generic term man, only in Genesis, the first few chapters, it translated Adam. But I think that that's unfortunate. Uh, I think a good translation would be the sons of men. It communicates to me as much, knowing the Old Testament, to say, awesome are his deeds toward the sons of Adam. Now, that communicates to me also. And I, I, I like keeping a distinction, but there's several different words for man uh, that sometimes have different connotations. Okay. Um, when we say, come and see the works of God who are awesome uh, and, uh, toward the sons of men, have it ever hit you hard <clears throat> why the majority of men turn away from God? Why the majority of God's creation rejects him, doesn't see his works, is not awed by what he does? The New Testament says that Satan has blinded the eyes of those who will not believe. Think, just for a minute, think with me. The good news is nothing less than eternal life, absolutely free for trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, who wants to give you the abundant life here and now, wants to save you eternally, wants you to live with him and have fellowship with the Creator God of all the universe. Wants you to have a happy marriage, wants you to have a, a, a meaningful life, wants you to not be afraid of death, wants to provide a companionship with his indwelling spirit, 
as well as all the promises of inheritance and being with Christ and all that, in the face of that kind of unbelievably marvelous offer, why do men turn away? And why do they turn away in such large numbers? I think they're, sca they're scared. Oh, that's a good one. They're afraid to see themselves as they are. Men love the darkness because their deeds are evil. I want to tell you the truth. Most people are not kept from Christ by intellectual arguments. Now, they may help some Christians increase their faith. Very few times you win somebody to Christ through intellectual arguments. Some of the great atheists have admitted the reason they're not Christians is because of the moral system that goes with Christianity. They like their sin and refuse to turn from it. That's exactly what John 3, 19 through 21 says. Notice here in verse 6 where it says, He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through the river on foot. Where is that in the Old Testament? What is that talking to? Mark? Joshua 3, the crossing of the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Where else? Crossing of the Red Sea in, in Exodus chapter 16, I believe. I mean, yeah, chapter 14. Notice, it's ambiguous enough to refer to both, isn't it? Both times the sea was dried up, both times they walked through on dry land, but notice, notice how the ambiguity conveys truth. One is judgment, and one is fulfillment of promise and blessing. Same allusion to God's drying the sea up and he walked, but Exodus was judgment on the nation of Egypt, and the Jordan was crossing into the promised land dry shod by faith. Same allusion, two different ways. Now, notice where it says, let us rejoice with him. Notice verse 7. I, I'm being a theologian. This thing caught my mind quickly when it says, he rules by his might forever. Now, the word he rules is a participle. Ruling he is in his power forever. Now, the word forever is the word olam. It has to be translated by the context. Because he rules by his power forever, that tells me God has been in control. God continues to be in control. And God will always be in control. Nothing happens outside of the will of God. This is not the devil's world. This is God's world. It always has been. It always will be. God is on the throne. Look at the second one. His eyes keep watching the nations. We could almost speak of God's omnipresence, couldn't we? That's what the picture is. Just like the vision of Ezekiel 1 where the wheels had eyes all the way around it. There you go. The omnipresence of God. And notice that God sees the affairs of nations. And then 13 through 20, God sees the affairs of individuals. You see, God knows all about Iran. God knows what the nations will do. But isn't the beauty of that, as God knows what the nations will do, God also knows and cares what you do. You know, 8 o'clock in the morning, when you bleary-eyed slither out, many of you slither out a lot than that, I do too, but um, whatever you do, get out of bed. And you wonder, wonder how the world may have been. God's there with you. You thought about that, the personal presence of God in your life on a moment-by-moment -moment basis? Also, that's where it says, he, let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Here we have the big picture, I think, that we've got to see, that evildoers will not prosper forever. Now, you know, in our, we get so upset in our world, we think, look at that. There's a guy who, does, who stomps on people, he cheats, he lies, he does everything he can to use people, and he's succeeding. Wait a minute, friend. You haven't seen the whole picture. You haven't seen the end. You just took a little snapshot out of the middle. And we've got to withhold judgment on the fairness of God until after Judgment Day. Those who seem so secure are very shaky. Uh, a new paragraph in verse 8. 
Bless our God, O peoples, is almost like verse 1. And sound his praise abroad, almost again, like verse 2. Who keeps us in life. That's a strange little Hebrew phrase. Who keeps us in life. God is the only source of life. There is no other source. And if it weren't for the moment-by-moment sustenance of life, we would cease to exist. God is the only thing that's immortal. And man is only ever living because of his relationship with God. God is the sustainer of the universe moment by moment. Life, real life, true life, is a gift from God and can be gotten from no other source. Life here and now and life forever is a gift from God. Notice where it says, and he does not allow our, our foot to slip. That's a common metaphor in the Old Testament about being on slippery clay and falling off the road in the ditch. It's the picture of the solid rock on which man is planted. It is the picture of God as keeper and guider of man. Well, I like the 23rd Psalm where it says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness. I like the 139th Psalm where he says, By his hand he guides us. The personal involvement of God in your life as well as in the affairs of our world. Uh, Notice where it says, verse 10, For he has tried us, O God. This is the word trying, meaning a uh, process of uh, burning the dross off from metal to purify the alloy. It's repeated in the next verse about that he tries us and we are refined as silver is refined. We could say Zechariah 13, 9 is a good uh, paraphrase. We could also say that 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Now I'll read that to you. 1 Peter 1, 7. That the proof or testing of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you do not see him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Everyone that God loves, God tests. Every child in his family is tested. Everyone. To not be tested by God is a sure sign you're not one of his. Because untested faith, though sincere, is very often inadequate to face life. God tests all of his children. You might want to think about Abraham. You might want to think about Joseph. You might want to think about the early church in Jerusalem. You might want to think about all the apostles. You might want to think on and on. Notice where uh, it says here, Thou didst bring us into the net. You see the word the net in verse 11? a strange word. That word is also translated in Psalms 18 to a strong tower or a fortress. The root word is the word hunting. Hunting. And from the root word hunting or hunt comes the word stronghold, meaning a hunting tower, and the word net, meaning an animal snare. And here the context demands it's an animal snare. It's as if someone has laid a trap for our feet, but God uses their evil purposes for his own purpose in our life. Look at the next one. Thou didst lay an oppressive burden upon our loins. Now, what's a loin? What's a loin? The thigh, from here to here. That's the loin. Now, you know Hebrews did not have the understanding of anatomy we do, and they thought different parts of the body represented different things. Does any of you know what this part of the body represents to a Hebrew? The loin? The thigh, muscle. Deuteronomy 33:11, and other places, it represents the strength of man. To be broken in the loin is to be powerless or without strength. And therefore, what it's saying is God is placing a pressure or burden on our strong point. <laughs> I think God's test will always come in the area of priority for you. I don't think God will pick your weakness to attack. That's the evil one. God will pick your strength and your priority, and he'll test you there to show that you love him. Because God's tests are to improve you, not to destroy you. Notice where it says, the next little phrase, very strange, that thou didst make men right over our heads. 
Now, Isaiah 53, 23 may be a parallel passage where they actually rode the chariots over the bodies of those who have died. But really, I think here we have a metaphor of evil men being in control of our destinies, we think. Have you ever felt like an employer was being unfair with you, but that he controlled your destiny? Have you ever felt like that the IRS, <laughs> though unfair, was controlling your destiny? <coughs> Have you ever felt like evil people sometimes get a control over your life? Know this, Christian brother, sister, young person. God is the controller of Christian lives. And God even used evil people and purposes for his purpose for our life. It also goes on to speak about the fact that um, we went through the fire and through the water. Now, that's the Old Testament way of talking about disaster. A good parallel passage is Isaiah 43, 2. Uh, I've forgotten where it is offhand. There's two passages that always strike me and always almost bring goosebumps to me. One of them is when the, the uh, three Hebrew children, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, come out of the fire furnace. And the Bible says, and there was not the smell of smoke on their body or a singeing of their hair. Flames didn't touch them. Another place that says the waters won't overflow you. I want to tell you, the disasters of life are sometimes overwhelming. But the child of God will always come through the disasters of life with faith and hope and a strengthened Christian life through the fire and the water. Yet thou didst bring us out into a place of abundance. There's a question down there in number four in discussion questions. What is the purpose of God's testing? Okay. And how would you fit it in this verse right here? Last part of verse 12. Not only to prepare us for service and to build us certain characters, but God's purpose, and we need to see this. It's not just like, oh, he's preparing us for eternity and he's just using us to witness to the people. God's purpose in our life is our best, our good. God doesn't want you to be miserable. God wants you to be satisfied with all the fullness that this world and the next has to offer. Have you ever thought that God does nothing to you that is not for your best, or your good, or your joy, or your peace. Think about that. Now, the word abundance here is translated a million ways in Hebrew, and I don't know which one it really is. It's translated refreshment. It's translated a wide, spacious place. It's translated a fruitful place. It's translated rest. It's not used very often. We don't have a whole lot of parallels in the other languages, the cognate languages, so we don't know exactly what it is. Abundance as good as any. Verse 13. We're going now from the corporate expression of who God is to the individual testimony of who God is. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Come and see for yourself what God's like. It's almost like Isaiah where he says, Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. They're free. Come. Buy. Without money. Come. Try God. Or it's almost like God himself when he speaks. Come now, let us reason together. Let's sit down and talk about it together. I would say to anybody who's thinking about becoming a Christian, who has tried other things in life, try God. If he fails you, forget him. If he doesn't meet your needs, blow him off. Try anything else you want. Try God once in your life. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. But that's where it says... Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Lost my place again. Okay. I shall come into thy house with burnt offerings. Now, of course, the word house can stand for temple or tabernacle. We don't, that doesn't help us in time any. But that's what it says with burnt offerings. Now, the word burnt offerings is used in Leviticus for total burnt offerings, which symbolizes complete dedication for God. But it's also used in another way outside of the cultic books of the Old Testament and it comes from the verb to make ascend or to rise. The implication is, is that sacrifice is burnt. The smoke or the aroma rises to God. Have you ever heard that unusual phrase in the Old Testament uh, that the aroma of the sacrifice rose to God? Or it was a soothing savor in his nostrils? Now, 
Uh, that gets a little crude if you take it literally that God sniffing around for sacrifices. But the picture there is that the attitude of man's heart as conveyed in the sacrifices, be it burnt or sin or thanksgiving or votive or whatever, rises to God as a pleasure to him. Man's attitude when right is a pleasure to God. Now, notice uh, where it says, I will pay thee my vows. I would almost paraphrase this in a colloquial way for us. If you say it, pay it. The Bible nowhere says you have to say it. The Bible nowhere says we are nowhere commanded to make a vow. Nowhere does God say, promise me this. Nowhere does it say, make a vow. But it does say over and over again, if you make a vow, you pay it. I think God says, I keep my word to you. I expect you to keep your word to me. I did what I did voluntarily. You did what you did voluntarily. Now you keep your word. But I want to read you a couple of places where I think this is really locked down for me. Let's look at Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers 30, verse 2, where God says, If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And then we could look again at Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23, where God says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be a sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. If you say it, you better mean it when you're talking to God. If you bring his name into your prayers and you start telling him what you're going to do, best do what you told him you're going to do. One more. This is the one that got me, helped me quit smoking. I thought oh, that was the hardest thing for me in the world. Oh, me. I still enjoy secondhand smoke at times. Um, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5, this is the one that just ate my lunch. You know, after you give something to the Lord, then you want to take it back, and you're reading your Bible, and then you come across this. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Now, why couldn't I see that before I promised? <laughs> you know, I was the other side of the coin. I already promised. I was stuck. There was no way out. Uh, that's Ecclesiastes 5, 4, and 5. A vow is a promise. Now, look at the next little verse down there where it says, which my lips uttered and my mouth spoke when I was in distress. Now, the word, the Hebrew word here, lips uttered, I would almost retranslate it, blurted out. And the next little late shows why. He was in distress. Have you ever heard of, uh, you heard of foxhole promises? You know, when the shells are banging overhead, we promise a whole lot of things. Have you ever been down sick and you think, oh, Lord, if I ever get out of here, I'll be back. Have you ever been really afraid some night and say, oh, God, you get me out of here, I'll never come back? What you say, you best do. And if you, if you say, God, help me, and I will, best you perform what you say. Now, notice where it says here, verse 15, I shall offer to thee burnt offerings of fat beasts. Now, it's not fat beasts, that's the fat of beasts, I think. If you read through Leviticus, what they did is they took the fat off the intestines and the kidneys. and the, They used the insides for sacrifice. Why do you think, why, in the, why do they use the insides? That's kind of a gross thing. They were, Nobody could eat it. No, that's not it. Why? What did the insides mean of the Hebrews? No, the seat of the emotions or the attitude. Isn't it beautiful that what's offered to God, even though it's in a ritual cultic system, is that part of the anatomy which the Hebrews meant his motive or attitude about possibly why he brought the sacrifice? And I, I've never read that. That's just my opinion. But I think there's a, there's a true symbolism there. Now, notice where it says, with the smoke of ram, that's the incense of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and male goats. Now, he, he kind of he brings all these things together to talk about all the different kind of sacrifices. Either that, 
Or boy, this old boy was afraid and promised everything. I don't, I don't know what it was. The word offer here in verse 14, the verb, is a technical term in the cultic books to offer a sacrifice. Verse 16, if you would, come and hear all you who fear God, okay? That's the repeating refrain through here. Uh, I will tell of what he has done for my soul. Now, the problem here in English is the word tell does not convey the best Hebrew understanding of this word. The primary meaning of this word in Hebrew is to count and recount. Have you ever, that little song, I don't know if it's a song or not. Uh, what is the song? Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Is that related to counting sheep? You know, that, the concept by count sheep, you can go to sleep. I don't know where that came from. Have you ever thought that one of the things that praises God is when we count and recount what he's done for us as far as blessings? You know, when you really get mully grubby, you ever get mully grubby, depressed, down, gripey? I know you don't. Uh, next time that happens in your life, why don't you just write down on a piece of paper the things that God has done for you? You can't be depressed in face of God's overwhelming love. Now, it's just normal for humans to get depressed. And if you get depressed, don't worry about it. It's, it's the common lot while we're here. But one way, I think, is to see what God's given to us and the blessings we have, and somehow the scales just always flop over to the goodness. Count and recount. And only secondary does it mean tell or proclaim. I think it's a good, a good to combine them. When we come to God and know him, we're going to count and recount what he's done for us. We're going to tell others. There's no way to know the love of God that comes into a man's heart and not tell others. You, you know, we just can't keep a secret that great. Uh, I cry. Notice in verse 17 and following, all the things about prayer, all the different ways of talking about it. I cried to him with my mouth. That's prayer. Uh, and he was extolled with my tongue. That's prayer. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's prayer for the negative sense. But certainly God has heard. There's prayer. And he has given heed to the voice of my prayer. There's prayer. Who has not turned away, he, who has not turned away from my prayer? There's prayer. Nor has loving kindness for me. Six things there. Mention about prayer. What, what does it say? First of all, it says that praise is a part of prayer. I don't know how. Do you start your prayers? Now, Lord, you know I need now, Lord, please give me. Now, Lord, I won't. I think a good way to start prayer is telling God how grateful we are for who he is. Maybe, uh, maybe a good little thing would be praising God for who he is, confessing who we are, and then dealing with our needs, you think? You know the story about the two angels I've told you a billion times. Two angels came to heaven with baskets. One were for the prayers of the saints in praise, and one was for the prayers of the saints in petitions. And one angel got a hernia. Which angel was it? <laughs> we just all the time telling God what we want. How long have we told God how much we love him and what we thank him for what he is? Uh, the second thing, I, I will extol thee with my tongue. You know, there's something I think about vocalizing prayer. I like silent prayer. I pray a lot silently. But you know, when I really get burdened about something, and I, I'm not the kind of guy who feel comfortable folding my hands and bowing my head in all situations. I just don't. I, it's a little pious for me. I just don't do it all the time. But I want to tell you, when, I, when, I, when God gets hold of my heart about something, I enjoy getting on my knees with the couch in my office, and I enjoy praying out loud. I close the door. I want nobody to know what I'm doing or hear what I'm saying or know anything about it. I, you know, I just want to be by myself. There's something about me praying out loud to God as if he was right there with me and knew. Now, of course, he knows my mind, and I can pray this well. But there's something about me saying it as if he was right there that helps me. Most what it says, if I regard iniquity or wickedness in my heart, have you ever thought, 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 thought that's, I like that. Have you ever thought that um, a crucial element of prayer is attitude and purpose. If you're just praying to get something that you can use for your own ends, friend, you can hang it up. You read the book of James, chapter 4. God knows our motives. And many times when we pray out of selfish, evil motives, the greatest blessing God does is not to hear our prayer. Have you ever thought that it's a blessing of God not to answer prayer? God knows our heart and our motives. The Lord will not hear. 
Now I'm going to look at John chapter 9, verse 31 for a parallel of that, where Jesus says the exact same thing. We say there's no such thing as answered prayer. Maybe not be unanswered prayer, but I'll tell you what, sometimes God puts his fingers in his ears. Now notice where it says, He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away. Now notice the, notice the interplay here. He prayed to God with a pure heart. He believed God would answer. And yet he comes back and says, even if, I, even, you know, even if I'm a wicked person or don't do all that I know, I know that God will not turn away from my prayer. And notice the last little phrase, nor his loving kindness for me. Not only do we pray, but when we pray, God acts. Now the word loving kindness is the word hesed. It's somewhat analogous to the New Testament word agape. I, every time I find the Old Testament, it's mercy in King James, it's loving kindness in New American Standard. Every time I find it, I want to put above it. Since I memorized it now, I don't put it over every time in my Bible, but you might want to for a while. Every time that word loving kindness and mercy, if you put over it, covenant faithfulness, unconditional love. Covenant faithfulness, unconditional love. That's who God is. Well, I hope you enjoy that psalm. I've got one minute for questions. Yes, Mark. God gives man freedom, but man's responsible for his freedom, isn't he? That's right. Yes, Glenn. didn't realize it. And all the time kept saying, I'm a free man, I do what I want. That's the most ridiculous statement in all the world. We're conditioned by environment, we're conditioned by heredity, we're conditioned by our co the age we live in. Only a dum-dum says, I'm free. <laughs> yes. That's why I think that the, the first step, I think, in coming to the Lord is a total commitment. Now, what we do, we tend to take part of that back down the line and take control. But that's when God's, and I use the word judgment in, in a sense, but that's when, it, when God comes in and says, it's over. Child, you can't go this way anymore. Is really an act of love, you know. And... Uh, I feel like sometimes I get people in my office and say, the hardest thing I can do is say your will in this. In the back of our mind, we really think to say yes to God's will, he'll make us do something we don't want to do. That's a, that's a shattering commentary on our view of God. You know, most I remember a lot of my preacher friends wouldn't even go to missions day because they said, well, if I give my life to God, he'll send me to outer Mongolia. Well, if he did, it'd be the best for you. He probably won't. That country can't hold many of us, you know. Um, I think when we see how much God loves us, how much he wants the best for us, then our own, our own desires of trying to grant happiness and peace will fade into his control slowly. And at the end, I think the greatest peace I have in all my life, and I, I have struggles just like you, but the greatest peace I have is God, if I know your will, I'll do it. And I think I'm doing it as close as I know. You know? You want me to do anything I'm not doing? You make it clear to me or let me be sensitive and understand it, and I'll do it. No question. That really, that gives you a real sense of peace. You know, I, I don't always do that because I balk sometimes, but uh, I try to keep an attitude and work at it.
Okay, let's uh, pray and ask the Lord's blessing. And hopefully, again, this this is not just you can go home and say, "Boy, I know Psalm 66 real well." I hope there's been a a life-changing confrontation tonight with you and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if it hadn't, maybe we hadn't been doing Bible study, or maybe you haven't been listening or praying. Yes. Yes, and of course I wouldn't make it as bad as I make it as acceptance, trusting him personally. The picture of the Christian life is whether you're 40 years old or 100 years old or a man or a woman, you start as a baby. And um, babies don't eat what teenagers eat in amount or content or consistency. My great fear is, I heard Billy Graham say, he thinks that uh, some inordinate amount, I forgot he said 40% of the church is not Christian. I feel like that a large, large number of the church are baby Christians. They've never grown. They've got in the kingdom and they sat down and want what they want. So maturity is a real prayer of not only my heart for myself, but for this church, and I hope it's a prayer for you. You know, instead of bending over backwards to weak Christians, why don't we start praying for and make them strong Christians? <laughs> Different approach.